to source material. And you look at existing code and use it as sort of a template to learn how other people have done it and how you should do it. The problem with that is if you accidentally pick one that's a bad example, and you, being a beginner, won't know, then your stuff will be bad. And that's a problem. The tool chains are, I don't want to say utterly unhelpful, but they are mostly unhelpful. Errors that should be reported as errors are not, frequently. For example here, I have a paragraph that has an error in it. Now, don't say it, but if you see it, raise your hand. Okay, two, three. Yep. Okay. There it is. That particular error is difficult for the human eye to see, even when you know what to look for. And if you're not familiar with DocWood, you may not know what to look for. There is something about the way the eye scans it, where those are those that closing paragraph tag with the missing slash is hard to notice. The tool chain doesn't care, because as far as it's concerned, you're starting a new paragraph that's inside the paragraph you're already writing. Oh yeah. Oh, no. uh, in fact, footnotes. I hate those because, for one thing, they don't particularly apply well in this day and age because if you're writing an HTML document, it may end up at the very end instead of on the relating to the page you're looking at. But a footnote, it, footnotes go inside a paragraph and have a paragraph tag inside them. That's terrible. It is. That's it, really it's, bad design. It's reprehensible. <laughs> All right, and of course, software-wise, we would say, why worry? If it builds, ship it. I mean, it's only documentation, right? It's not like something you need. <laughs> and that is the way that a lot of uh, a lot of projects look at documentation. It's nice to have, but it's not essential like the program. I've heard that OBI theory too. Yes, that, that's true actually. Quality. Quality of your documentation ensures the quality of your program. Uh, the, the best program in the world is useless if you can't figure out how to run it. And consistency in your documentation encourages quality in your documentation. Keep it consistently good, and then keep it consistent. And also, maintenance. If your documents are under-maintained, they become difficult to work on. Clean, consistent documents are easier to understand, easier to understand for the writer, easier to maintain, and easier to modify for people who may or may not be good at editing documentation. You want to make it easy to modify for programmers who rarely edit documentation, or for new contributors, or anyone you can. And if you can make it easier for those people who rarely modify documentation, you'll make it easier for the people who modify it all the time. And of course, another reason to worry about why your documentation should be good, consistent, clean and of quality is that you're always going to be looking at converting to other formats. For example, <coughs> FreeBSD right now we're doing the Docbook XML conversion. For some reason, I never caught on to a lot of people hate, hate, hate Grok. I'm not really clear on why that is. Somehow I just missed it. It's probably because I have not uh, been involved with it very much. But there's the Mandoc uh, programs from OpenBSD that is pretty much a drop-in replacement for Grok. It's not 100%. There are certain features that are used in man pages that Grok supports that Mandoc does not. And so if our documentation is consistent, we can script this conversion and allow for those missing features. And of course, there's always future formats. There's always going to be something different. We, we talked about Mallard. You can go from Docbook XML to Mallard. If your documents are consistent, that becomes an easy conversion in relative terms, either by hand or by program. If they're not consistent, if there are errors in there like 
broken paragraph tags like we looked at earlier, that conversion involves hand fixing. And that just slows everything down. Another problem that happens, and another reason to avoid the why worry just ship it, is entropy. And I have an example here. Entropy, is anybody not familiar with what I mean when I say that? Entropy is the accumulation of disorder. Garbage sneaks into files. Programs are usually a little touchier about that because compilers are pickier than people. But documentation, you can get away with things. Problems build up, and the documentation still kind of works. But here's my example. The FreeBSD Porter's Handbook is a book. It's about 50,000 words, uh, 16,000 lines of Docbook HTML. The book itself tells people how to port applications so they will build on FreeBSD. It's a reference manual. To fix white space problems alone, that is, lines that are too long, paragraphs that need to be rewrapped, uh, the wrong number of spaces at the beginning of a sentence, required an 8,000 line commit. I know because it was me. <laughs> it hurts. But this is white space problems that had accumulated in this document over the last however many years it's existed, probably at least 10. And the problems accumulated because there was nothing looking for them. It hurts. And we may be in that situation soon. But after my 8,000 line commit, I had to do another 4,000 line commit. Now, that's not 12,000 lines in total. Some of those overlap. But clearly, you're talking somewhere between half and two thirds, or excuse me, three quarters of that entire thing. And that's unacceptable. We need to automate that. Something should be looking at those. So what can we do to address these types of problems? We need to make things easier for writers, particularly for writers who don't work on documentation all the time. And in my case, that would be something like man pages where I will edit one once in a while, but by the time I'm editing one, it's been months or, or at least weeks, and I've forgotten many of the details, the specific rules that apply only to man pages. If we can make this easier, we can encourage programmers to document their work. And that's, that's a hard problem. It's fun to write a program. It's not so fun to try and explain to people how it works. And we, the, the programmers, as the people who implement that, need to be encouraged to document that. Because they're on the front line. They know how it's supposed to work. But we also need to encourage the end users to document that because they're the, uh, the target. They're the people who experience the actual problems that the programmers didn't anticipate. And that's an extremely valuable source of, uh, source of information. Those people experience what actually happens. And we want to get that, that valuable experience in because it may be at odds with what the programmer intended or expected. But we need to make it easy for them to write on documentation to get them. And of course, we need to encourage writers to expand and clarify the documentation make it easier to understand, but let it get the message across. And what can we do to do all this? Well, automated proofreading. We need to write a program that checks this kind of thing. It needs to remember things. And I say that as a sufferer of CRS syndrome. Anybody else here? Anybody know what that can't remember stuff? <laughs> okay. One of the uh, when you become a free free BSD committer, you have mentors for a certain length of time that make sure you know the rules and how to commit safely to things and just general guidelines. And one of my mentors, Glenn Barber, is like an encyclopedia. Oh, when you change a man page, there you've got to do that. And this was what kind of started the problem because every time he knew all these things. And even if I'd been told before, I didn't remember half or any of them. So that was sort of the start for this particular project. We also need a program that can look for errors. 
Think of a human proofreader. That's what we need only in program form because we can't afford to pay a human proofreader. We need to look for subtle errors, but also errors of inexperience. We can help the writers comply with standards. We can do things like look for allowed words and look for disallowed words, the whitelist and blacklist. And we can say, hey, you used this word, but the project says for that particular thing, we want you to refer to it this way. And that's the type of thing that the computer, with its tons of memory and its fast processor just sitting there, should be able to help me with. Oh, and I should, for a second, before I go forward. What that does is if we have a program that reports on the problems, is that indirectly educates the user on the standards. Because if it complains, oh, you abbreviated this the wrong way, and we don't like that, after you've seen that a dozen times, it will stick in your head. And some of those standards, you will become educated on that merely to avoid the tool complaining about them. <clears throat> we can keep those mistakes out of the tree. Uh, any database person will tell you it is far, far easier to check your input than to try and find mistakes that are in your database afterwards. And we can let the writer concentrate on the message. Leave the rote work to the computer. Like I said, it's got all that stuff there. Why is it not helping me? So what can we automate? Because there are many things we can. But there are things we can't. For all files, we can test simple things like spelling. Now, we took kind of an opposite approach to this. Rather than writing a spelling checker, which will frequently find and identify valid words as misspelled, like in code or the typical spelling checker looks for words that it knows, and anything it doesn't know is identified as a spelling error. We went the other way. There are common misspellings that we cull from FreeBSD problem reports, bug reports, uh, man pages, doc book source, anything I could find. And really, it's a, actually a pretty short list. I think now it's a, about 400 words. But it's amazing how many times those are caught. Certainly, we will let some slip through, but they will be unusual errors. And unusual stuff is up to the human to handle. Let's handle the rote stuff with the computer. Who let me go with that? That's mine. That's a really cool idea. That's a great idea. Well, thank you. It's, it has surprised me in a few ways. Uh, and one thing I, I tell people and they get a little nervous about is that the same, the same people tend to stick with the project, either for a medium time or long time. And they tend to, as you, by the time you're an adult, which most people who contribute are, your brain has kind of gel. And if you misspell a word one time, you are probably going to repeat that. That is probably how that word lives in your brain. And I've told people that reading certain man pages, you almost get an idea who wrote it without knowing. Uh, it's kind of, I've found a few man pages I've read in the same way where I suddenly found myself reading it in a Slavic accent. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it was missing articles. And I just said, it's not a problem. <laughs> and so we did have people concerned that we would track errors by person. And that was not the point. Although, it did give me some ideas. You have like the British watch? The what? The British watch. Uh, <laughs> you have people spelling color in the U.S. Uh, we can. In FreeBSD, we actually have a rule that if a man page, our standard is American English, but if a man page or document was written originally in British English, it's allowed. So there's, there's a little wiggle room there. We're not very strict about it, although we can be. What do you do about uh, Canadians? Uh, Canadian, yeah, well, that was mentioned yesterday. Canadians have like one foot in one country and one foot in the other. British spelling, but, uh, but uh, Mary's words and, and punctuation. And then they have some of their own words too, I believe, that don't really. Uh, like color, like we add use. Wherever you guys remove these, we do the British. Right, but you have an elevator, not a book. 
Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. And we. And a truck, not a lorry. And yeah. yeah. Depends on what part of the country. Center. We don't have a lorry anywhere in Canada. I don't, I don't think. <laughs> and, and, oh come on! That's one of the most common names in North America. And, and you said, and you said, you add use. Actually, in the U.S., use is is a word in some places. <laughs> you may be getting to this, but I use that technique for finding correct correct words, correctly spelled words that are used in the wrong place. And I don't mean things like there and there. I mean, I, I have those are very. I would love to come up with a test. For those that doesn't require some artificial but it, it, intelligence, it, it, for particular writers, I find it really, you know, it just goes through and finds. When when you find that mistake in a document, it tends to be repeated. If they use that word, they misspell that word, they use it again. You will find that, and that's the nice thing about using those errors is like that is that particular person is bound to have contributed other things, other documents, quotes, uh, source code for that matter. Repeated words. It's amazing how many of these there are. And in fact, many of these tests I'll talk about, they, either I thought of them or somebody else suggested them. And it's all, the reaction is always sort of, well, there, yeah, there's not going to be that many of those. I mean, OK, one that's been suggested but has not yet been implemented is external references in a man page. See also such and such. And in the list, the see also list, many times those will be repeated. The same reference will be in there twice in two different places. And the question, you know, immediately to me it occurs, well, okay, so this example has that. How many more of those can be in there? Every time I add a test, many things pop out. They're all through there and have not been noticed, like spelling errors, because the human eye just doesn't see them. Or somebody saw them but didn't think it was worth entering the bug report. Or it was a translator error or something. Oh, and I should also say, I have had people suggest that, yeah, well, it's people who don't have English as a first language. And I should add, in my experience, people who speak English as a second language generally speak it better than the natives. Because they care more, I think. I'm not entirely sure why. Except but for the articles. And they something. studied grammar. <laughs> well, and also for native speakers of English, when you learned it, you were a little kid, and that's long, long ago, and it's not as fresh in your mind. But repeated words and problems like that, I do not find, are generally because of English as a second language speaker. Do you find that that gives you a lot of false positives? No, actually. Repeated words like, let me give you an example. You're writing a sentence. The reason I am about to say this is, and you stop to think for a second, is because it is blue. And you've repeated is, and that's another one of those errors that's kind of difficult to see. If you're reading, if you're editing particularly, if you're a reader, you will hit that, it's like tripping over something. Is, is, it, it, and, and. Those words tend to be repeated a lot and also repeated when one of them is at the end of the line and the other is at the beginning of the next line. Yeah. So well, it turns that. out there are a lot of those. And there are very, very few valid uses of repeated words in English. Do you think that that, that is valid? In the case of this yeah. tool, it will report that as an error. And in my sense, if you're writing this technical documentation, you should probably avoid that. The, the southern one is done, done. What about hot, hot? Oh, I don't know. Rewrite. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in many cases, though, uh, and I will talk about false positives in a second here, but very poor there are very, yes, there are very few places in English where it's valid to have a repeated word, enough so that. Uh, in this tool, it will report those. And the neat thing about that test is you don't care what the words are. It will find repeated words by just looking for one word followed by that word again. So you don't need to have a list of those. You can just check for everything. And that does catch a lot. That's surprising.
bad phrases. These are another one that gets blamed on non-native English speakers, which really is not something they do that often. Uh, the examples down here at the bottom, the two and two four, again, I think that's due to the way people write on computers. You will start a sentence, pause to think about what you're going to say, and then continue on without remembering to delete the word you'd already had. Now this is anti-Canadian, because that's how we write here. And that's you? Two fours. Two fours. I think it's a different four, isn't it? Yeah. And a different two. <laughs> This tool tests for writing style in a fairly simple-minded way. It looks for words. And several of us, uh, myself and Glenn Barber, we hate the, the overuse of you and your in documentation. That it's, and this goes back to our FreeBSD guidelines. Uh, we have a documentation project primer for new contributors. And our guidelines say, Avoid the use of you and your, try to be formal as opposed to informal. You're going to have to fight with Florian now. Well, and there's this, there are style issues there, I, I admit. But we check for that in this, in this tool. And it just doesn't count. If you've used 100 U's in a paragraph, there may be a problem there. It's probably too informal. Should, we talked about these in our earlier project this week, there is a group of weasel words, should, probably, maybe, that are weak on the part of the writer. This should work. Well, you're writing it. Is it going to work or not? Don't, don't give me that wishy-washy weasel word. Should it is another one of those where however many times it's in there is probably too many. Unless you're talking about RFC 2119. Which one is that? Uh, must, should, oh, may, yes. must not. Yes, but then you must put it but in that case, it has to be in all caps. I thought that, I thought that we don't use all been, caps at W3C. I thought that might have been one about the, the, the pigs, the pigs with sufficient thrust. <laughs> the, where pigs will fly out. Anyway. Uh, obviously, it's needless to say, and this is what Sean was referring to, if it's obvious, do you need to use the word obvious? Because if you need to word, use the word, maybe it isn't obvious. If it's needless to say, don't well, say it. <laughs> if, so, if someone needs no introduction, <laughs> that, but usually that leads into a huge long introduction. Also, of course. So again, this tool to counts say. those. It says you've say. used this many. <laughs> may, it, in many cases, it suggests alternatives. Uh, starting too many, uh, simply and basically. This is maybe on the part of the reader but these can be taken as patronizing. Simply, simply is a little different because it can be referring to how easy a thing is to do. But basically, often means I'm going to dumb this down for you because I don't think you can handle the whole, all the details. And that can be read that way on the part of the reader, but that's something to watch. Starting too, too many sentences with the is dull. E.g., I.E., and other Latin-based things which are almost always used incorrectly. If your audience is scientific or academic, it's one thing. But for computer-type stuff, that's often not the case. And E.g. and I.E., in addition to being used improperly without commas many times, people get the meanings backwards. And I actually looked up the Latin for these. Being an American-educated person, I don't know anything about Latin or pretty much in English. They are used backwards. E.G. is the for example one. I.E. means that is. But, in essence, well, in example is one that I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, particularly in man pages, there should be examples. Even a trivial example is better than no example. A good example is better than a trivial example, but I'll take what I can get. Yes. Uh, Another thing with the simply and basically, um, an experienced user might feel they're being talked down to, an inexperienced user might feel intimidated. Like, for the next step, all you have to do is compile the Linux kernel or something it, like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Simply, and then there's like three simply. pages of stuff. It's like, <laughs> that doesn't look simple to me. Now, there is tremendous potential to expand on this. 
right now this tool just looks at words, individual words, and counts them up. And that's simple-minded. There are tools. Oh, earlier we talked about reading level, the grade level of the English you are writing. Does anybody remember the original justification for why Unix was written? It is worse than better. No. How they sold the project of writing Unix. Wasn't it to, to well, they, no, it's not how they sold it. They did it so that they could port a game to it. No. That was, they did that, but that yeah, wasn't but the reason. They sold. The justification was to help word processing. Remember that story? No. Uh, how can I remember something? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look this up. Look this up. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember which uh, Dent, Richie or the other guy. Uh, they need the office staff was writing things, and they said, you know, if we wrote a little operating system that allowed you to use these tools, it would improve the word processing efficiency. And one of the ancient packages that's been around, and this has been suggested to me elsewhere, is called Unix Tools. It will analyze the grammar of your text file. It will tell you the grade level, which is always embarrassingly low. I, I will tell you that now. Maybe it's just me. It's like, oh, you're writing at a fifth grade level. And, but presumably, there is a grade level that you can target. And that, that was called Unix tools. Those, those two, the grammar, and uh, I don't remember what the reading level checker is called. But they're out there. And they're ancient. Uh, the problem we have with modern doc documentation with those is they don't strip out the markup. So you have to do that first before feeding your text into these tools. But with that kind of smart analysis of your health text, your document text, we have tremendous potential to expand this. A program could come back and say, this paragraph is too long. Or better yet, what is the subject of this sentence? Or better yet, why is this sentence even here? And that type of thing can certainly be done. If a compiler can tell me that it's going to optimize a loop out of my program, why don't we have programs that can do that for English, which has been around far longer? Because English is substantially mm -hmm. harder to parse. Possibly. Have you seen the C program test? <laughs> All right, test for man pages. And in not previous days, we love man pages. I know that some other people are not that fond of them, but we love them. And they are important to us. We have sort of an unwritten rule that says sentences should begin on a new, new line. The graph doesn't care. It doesn't enforce that. But we have a semi-formal rule. And if we have a program to test for that, it kind of becomes a formal rule. It's a warning. And again, people will say, hey, it, it warned me about this. I will fix it. And they have been encouraged to comply with that standard without being forced to. Uh, you're saying that every paragraph is one sentence long? Is that what you mean? Mm, in I mean, in MDoc, it's just in the source. In it's the source. in the source. Okay. It, MDoc does not say that when you, after you type a period and a space, you have to start a, on a new line for the next sentence. But that's something we we want to do as a free BSD standard. Is this one of those like double new line for a new paragraph? No. It's just uh, you're typing a sentence, you hit a period another space and you start another sentence, we don't want that. We want that next prayer, that next sentence to start on the next line. So every new sentence should start on a new line. In addition to word wrap and all. But that way all your all your sentences start at the left now. Yeah, well and one reason for doing that is that um, it reduces the amount of kind of spurious text uh, diffs. As in if you're not worrying about reflowing your lines when you change a sentence then you'll have really fewer diffs that are due just to moving words around from one line to another. That's right. a really, really good point. But the problem we had with that before was there was nothing enforcing it, or nothing even looking for it. So people could do whatever they wanted, <coughs> and there was no suggestion that there was anything wrong with that. Yeah. Document data. This is mine. This is, this is the thing that started me down this road document date on a man page should be updated when you make non-trivial changes to it. And in my case, what happens is I make my changes, I commit it, I go, oh no, 
I change it, I commit it, and along, along with an apology message. That's the typical steps, and I want to eliminate a few of those steps. That is what uh, Glenn Barber, just every time, he, he remembered that. And like I say, when I worked on Man Page, it may have been months ago that I worked on Man Page last time. Well, certainly a program can check that that has been updated. Structure. There are eight minimum macros that are supposedly required. In, in the MDoc7 Man Page, it says you need these eight minimum macros in this order for a Man Page. The tool chain does not require all of them. But it should. What are they? In what order? Anybody know? I don't. That's why I have them on here. This is what they are and the order they go in. For DocBook, there are a completely different set of tests we can do. And again, we have rules that we described in the FreeBSD documentation primer that are not formal rules. They're and essentially, until we have a program to use them, they are suggestions. White space rules we have for width, width of a line, we say wrap your lines at 70 columns. Not 72, not 80, not 130, but 70. And again, there's nothing checking for that. Uh, for indent levels, use two spaces. When you get to eight, replace it with a tab. Uh, I, know, I know that that's contentious. That's just what we have in our guide. So you, you don't start sentences on these lines in, in your in document? document? No. No, totally different set of rules for this, different set to remember, which I have a computer there with all, even my worst, lowest level computer has plenty of me memory to remember all this stuff. And I, I'm just looking at it, why are you not helping me? You're just sitting there. Indentation, two spaces for each level. Uh, and we have certain suggestions and rules about that, which the DocBook tool chain doesn't really care about, but we do. And the way to do parrot tags and all that. Tag usage style, like when you put in a program listing, put a blank line before and after it, that's just suggestions, again, but we can have a tool that checks for that. And it becomes a standard. Title capitalization. Oh, this is a good one. Nobody knows how to do that. It's, it, and I blame the English teachers, but it's really probably not fair to blame them. It's probably newspaper publishers from the 1700s who started that. The, the horrible long list of rules, and there is no way you will win. Whether to capitalize words of a certain length, all that. And it was totally inconsistent, inconsistent, and again, nothing cared. There was nobody, uh, only humans were looking at that. And if you got it wrong, there was nothing to tell you that it was wrong, or better yet, to tell you what right would be. So we can put in a check for that. We can say, let's follow the AP style guidelines for title capitalization. Let's have the program tell you what this title should be capitalized as. That would terrible sense, but I'm going to move on anyway. And so what all this results in is a program I call Igor the Lab Assistant, as somebody who will help you on questioning me. <laughs> and the, the design guidelines were, it has to be easy and quick to use. If it's a pain to use, people aren't going to use it. We don't want to discourage them for any reason whatsoever. We want to have it help them and be quick. It should auto-detect the type of input file, because we've already seen you can feed it at least three and you shouldn't have to tell it what kind of file that is. It should handle multiple files and compressed files. So if you want to change into one of the man directories that has a bunch of compressed man pages in it and feed all those to it, it should handle that. It should test for conformance with the FreeBSD documentation primer, documentation project primer, as a way of encouraging people to treat those rules as rules. OpenBSD did a thing where they said, if you submit a new program without a man page, we will revert it. You cannot commit without a man page. And while I admire that sort of uh, strictness, it's not really our thing. And I would rather encourage people to conform with the rules we have than force them to. It, it just, I feel like when you push like that, people push back, and I would rather pull. 
It should be able to limit the tests it does because maybe you're only looking for a certain problem or maybe you're only changing uh, a few lines out of a 20,000 line book. And it should be able to limit that. Maybe you just want to check spelling, maybe you just want to check for repeated words. But well, if you want to wait till I get to the last one, it will. Yep. I think the next one is the last one. It should avoid false positives because if you get too much, too many false positives in the output, it becomes a signal to noise problem and people will ignore it. It will not be worth using. And implementation. This is the part that people really love. It's in Perl, but whatever. I do not care at all what language it's in. And in fact, I've told people this before, and I will tell all, you, all of you here, I challenge you to rewrite this program in anything else or in Perl. I don't care, but do it better. And I also, if you come up with what to call this category of program, I would really like to know because it really makes searching for it easier. I don't know what you call this type of thing. The only thing that is similar is lint for source code. And that might be a start. Kind of evokes that with CK too. I don't know. What did you say, Ryan? Kind of makes you think of that with CK. Makes you think of that with CK. I don't think any tech writers are going to Google for that with CK for <laughs> as, automated documentation. As far as how it works, it's mostly regular expressions. I find both of, incidentally, I find both of the abbreviations for regular expressions horrible to say, so I'm not going to say either. Regular expressions is mostly what it does. And so if you choose to re-implement this program and do it better, and I'm sure you can, probably want to pick a language that deals with regular expressions as well. What does it look like? And for this, can we turn off the, the last light? Because these are screenshots that may be easier to see that way. I thought we were going to get to look at the regular expressions. Oh, well, we can. OK, now bear with me on this one. This is ugly, but it gets better soon, I hope. Here's the invocation of the program. We're giving it, we're looking at man pages here, and we're telling it not to check the document date because we're looking at a bunch of existing ones without plans to change them, and we don't want those dates checked. We don't care about those at this point. Here's a list of man pages I'm giving it, feeding the output into less and cutting it off so it fits on the screen. And here you can see on KGB, the debugger, there's a bad phrase, 2-4, and it's highlighted with brackets. And there are a few more errors in here, spelling errors, trailing white space on a line, that type of thing. I'm not going to dwell on this because this plain ASCII output, I do not like. I find this difficult to read. The only reason it is in the program is for the potential that somebody could integrate it with their editor. So you can say, check this document I'm working on, jump straight to the line that has the problem, and show the error to it. So the better way it is stolen from, uh, pretty much stolen from a program called CodeSpell, which is a spelling checker that should be able to handle code and documentation. And this is the exact same, oops, sorry, wrong button. This is the exact same invocation, except now we're giving it the dash R, telling it to use ANSI color highlight sequences, and we're, that corresponds with the dash R used to less. And this, so we get the same errors, but now they're highlighted in color. And the problem areas in the lines are in green here. Uh, spelling, extension is spelled wrong. Uh, repeated words will not be, be automatically removed. Here is a m.dot macro that's missing, or excuse me, used here, but the one that's supposed to be before it has not been used. And again, so there's tabs after a white space. There are so many problems that can happen with white space that are difficult to find because it's invisible. Uh, unless you run certain modes of Vim or, or other things, we'll talk about in a second. And here's our informal rule, sentences not on a new line. You can see here's what they had and they started this next sentence on the same line. And again, some more missing m.macros. This is the writer's style test and as you can see, it's fairly, like I said, simple-minded. It counts up how many times these things are used. 
but it does try to be this this particular test you have to ask for it doesn't show you this one because this is more of a suggestion it, it's very uh, oh, it's up to interpretation how seriously it should be taken I guess is what I'm saying uh, like it says should it's people and it, then it also explains what these, the EG, it's Latin, exempli, gratia, means for example, which most people get backwards. But almost all the time those are used, there should be a comma. When you're saying, for example, you pause after that. There should be a comma after those. It looks terrible because it's EG dot, you know, E dot, G dot, comma, which is another reason that you'd be better off just replacing it with the English equivalent, which is for example. And it talks about IE, uh, it talks about using simply and basically that can be read as patronizingly. And it points out some of these other things. Like I say, those Unix tools and other programs that are smart written, work on the sentence or paragraph level. There's tremendous potential here for improving our documents automatically. I mean, at least giving suggestions. Mm. This is a docbook file, and because, like everybody else, we deal with translators, we separate our white space commits from our content commits so that translators don't have to deal with the white space mixed in. And this is a white space only check. We're again using the dash R, which means use ANSI color highlights. Capital Z means white space only. We're only interested in tests that check the white space. And here it shows this is a too long line, and here's where you could wrap it, highlight it. Uh, use tabs instead of spaces. Again, that's our rule. At the beginning of the line, if you have eight spaces, that should be a single tab. And I know that's, some people hate that, some people, that, it doesn't matter, that's our standard. Here's a bad index, and you would have to look at this in the document itself to know, but this can be caused by several things, but the program detects that. <clears throat> and that was one, I wasn't sure how many occurrences of improper indentation we had until I got a halfway decent test in here to check it, and they're all over. It's, it's very difficult to deal with that indentation on your own, which I know there are programs that handle all the XML stuff silently for you, Many people do not use those, at least for FreeBSD documentation, yet. Um, Straggling closing paragraph tag means that should be at the end of the content on the line above it. And again, some more other problems down here which are the same thing. And finally, the content. Uh, it checks for capitalization in titles. And it does that by the uh, Associated Press rules, which turn out to not be that hard to write a program for, at least the, the majority of the time. It's a short list of words you can check for. Now these particular problems, these are all the names of programs. If those were wrapped in application tags, or file name tags, or literal, or command tags, the capitalization check would ignore those, assuming that since you wrapped in a tag, you knew what you were doing. Spelling checks in here, there's no comma after this EG, which is a an error regardless of whether or not you should use EG at all. Uh, more capitalization check. Here is one that detects that error that we saw way back at the beginning. Here's an open, opening paragraph tag without a closing paragraph tag before it. That is an error that uh, actually, those were very hard to find and were holding up the conversion to Docbook XML because it would hit one of those and then that would have to be fixed and then you could start again and you'd find the next one. Oh, and then uh, here's a better capitalization <coughs> example here. Again, that should be wrapped in file name or command tags. Uh, this one, for example, capitalization. Attaching the provider with the generated key. Well, the first and last word should always be capitalized regardless. And the is right, with is right, and the is right. But that's another word in there that should be capitalized and is not. So it's highlighted here to tell you that's where the problem is. Can you give a TLDR of the AP rules? <laughs> I, I might have that actually in the program. I can't recall. Okay. 
But it, it, it isn't that hard to find. The problem is, as usual, going from the rules to an algorithm. And it turns out that if you, if you have a few, a word, short word list of words that should never be capitalized, the words that should always be capitalized, along with a little bit of processing there, it's not that bad. How do you, I mean, you handle, um, if you just do it from word by word, many of the rules, I don't know why these rules, uh, but many of them will say, uh, you know, prepositions, you, uh, you don't capitalize uh, unless you're using them uh, adverbially, adverbially as part of a, a verbal phrase like um, um, backup. And that's the, oh, yes. uh, well, that's not and that's one of the shortcuts that we took is we just don't care about that. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of a condensed version of those AP rules, but it catches almost everything. And the worst we get is false positive, which I can't recall ever seeing on that capitalization test. I'm sure it will produce them at some point, but they're really, really rare. And that's possibly just because of the writing just the style that people tend to use. Okay, where is it? Well, it's in the previous report system if you use that. I know there's two of us here that do. <laughs> That's in that directory. It's also on my home page here, and don't get that typing anxiety or write down anxiety here because we'll come back to this in a second. And lessons learned from this program. Optimize regular expressions. Optimize the hell out of them. Short circuit whenever you can so the thing goes as fast as it can. Can we turn the lights back up a little? Okay, at this point it should be good. That there are many time, many many places you can skip. Blank lines, you don't need to check the spelling on blank lines. And so there are many chances for optimization, which in a program that runs regular expressions, hundreds or thousands of them on every line, you want to avoid that whenever possible. Uh, Doc with guest email trivia, <laughs> indentation is non-trivial. And when I say that, of course, you know there are only two categories of things, trivial and non-trivial. It's terrible. Uh, there are, DocBook has a lot of exceptions, and to get that right, that particular section of the code is the one I would really hope somebody would rewrite, because it's awful. I apologize for it in advance. It sucks, <laughs> it's terrible. Do not look at it. If you're writing your own, write a new one from scratch. It's very difficult in a program, and yet it's even harder for people. And that's what we found with that. And yet, that code, for as bad as it is, pretty much works. So it has that going for it. Syntax highlighting is really good for white space, it turns out. Uh, if you use the nano editor or Vim, Nano, I have a little file for that on my website, which I showed earlier, and we will show again in a second. If you use syntax highlighting to see that white space, you will see how often there are blank lines that are not really blank, how often there are tabs after spaces, how often there are spaces at the end of lines. I'm thinking we could reduce the size of documentation by a non-trivial amount just by getting rid of all that useless stuff. The problem is it's invisible. And that's what syntax highlighting can be used for. Advertising. And when I say that, I mean advertising this program. Because I've had people, uh, as an example, the, uh, the Russian guys whose names I forget and probably can't pronounce for Nginx, the web server, they had a, a spelling error in one of their doc files. And I, I wrote to them saying, hey, this is interesting, a spelling error in Russian. And they were kind of apologetic about it. And I said, oh, well, hey, here's this, this program called Igor. You might get some use out of it. It might give you some ideas. And they said, hey, we ran that on our readme file, and we found mistakes. And it, at that point, it hadn't even occurred to me that it could be used for that. Uh, so the advertising is getting the word out that this program is available more as a uh, proof of concept than as a finished product. What I'd like to see is something really smart developed saying, yeah, well, that original program is sort of a proto crappy proof of concept. And here's this one we wrote that is actually usable. So that's part of the reason I'm here, is just to get the word out about it saying, as writers, we've been terribly, terribly underrepresented in the computer software industry. There should be smart tools out there that will help you do your writing. And 
really, there aren't. It's surprising how little there are. The Ingenix guy is named Igor. What? The Ingenix guy? Oh, his name is Igor. Oh, well, <laughs> I was thinking about the last name, which, as I recall, had a lot of consonants. They were great guys, too. So, uh, And what can we do for the future? Well, of course, a rewrite. Better language, or faster, or checks more, or I don't care. Uh, if it did the same thing, but was more modular, or more extensible, whatever. More tests? For the, the the Perl version could have more tests in it, and that would be good. Get a package in Debian. Uh, okay. It's like uh, the most important thing you can do for probably most people in this room. Okay, I might uh, ask for your help on that. The nice thing is, it is a standalone Perl program. It will run in Perl, I believe it will, will run in Perl 5.6 even. So. Uh, there's nothing else to it. It's just a Perl program. It has no other dependencies. And, and one of the reasons that Perl was chosen to begin with was the hope that there was there were some type of modules on CPAM that would do some of this stuff. And to date, I haven't found them, but that was part of the justification. Better Dockbook indentation testing. It is terrible. It, we need that. Uh, it needs to be smarter. It needs to handle things like the way that footnotes are placed inside a paragraph, you're writing along, you want to put a footnote in, you put the footnote tag in line with the text and your starting paragraph tag for the footnote, and then your footnote text, and then your close footnote, close paragraph tag, close footnote tag, it's all in line, it's awful. Uh, but it doesn't have to be in line, so there are at least two different ways to embed it. Uh, I don't know. I have a feeling that there is somebody out there who says, oh yeah, I wrote one of those 10 years ago, here it is, it works fine. But maybe not. Advanced language analysis, like I talked about on the sentence or paragraph or document level. Help me. Help me write better. Help me convey the ideas better. And certainly, with the computers we have, there is no reason they can't do that other than it just hasn't been written. And other languages, and when I say that, I mean other human languages. The neat thing about Dockbook and man page markup is that it's in English. It doesn't change. The translators are still using the same markup. And so this program will work on those. The only thing we need to do to make it work for, say, Russian or German is add a list of commonly misspelled words in Russian or German, which was why I had contacted the Nginx guys. And they, I probably did that wrong. They were somewhat embarrassed about having a spelling mistake that they had. And I wanted it. I didn't communicate to them effectively that it was valuable to me. They, did, they were embarrassed about it and didn't want to go into it. And that's it. I want to give a special thanks to my FreeBSD mentors, Glenn Barber and Benedict Rushing, and also to the FreeBSD Foundation, which got me here. And there's that link I promised you before to my web page. And that's it. <laughs> Any other questions before I turn this off? Um, um, yeah, a couple of things. So there's an enterprise level product, I don't even remember the pricing on it, and it's called Acrolinks. And it is the leading uh, quality checker for documentation in the enterprise, and it's probably tens of thousands of dollars, literally. Um, so I'm super excited to see this. Do you recommend running, would you recommend this as, well, I'm trying to think how, how I would start with my own documentation, right? So do I run it once and go, oh, crap? Or do I kind of integrate it into, um, we have a continuous integration system, do I just run it as an automated test on that? I, I, it has been suggested that this could be integrated, we use uh, SVN for our uh, documentation now in FreeBSD, it has been suggested that this could be integrated as a pre-commit hook. Right. Uh, the problem with that is English, and particularly this tester, there's some fuzzy areas where it's a judgment call whether or not something is right. Yeah. And it will find occasionally false positives you'll get in, uh, there are examples of text files where they're, uh, oh, like LDAP, LDAP would be repeated. And it's correct. And it's supposed to be. Uh, but the repeated word test will find it. 
So it's not really something that I would trust as the final authority okay. uh, to prevent commits or to say whether a document is good or not. Do you consider Could like you? a CI type approach? Where you have like a bill pot that's, I, that's, I my that's what she yeah, was, that's my that's what she yeah. was suggesting. Yeah. And because, I mean, we've even we, had people say, why don't we do a spell check before we, and it's like, could we do baby steps towards CI? Uh, that's, or then do you just get blind to all we, errors? We've talked about that, and that is one of the problems. What you really need to do before you do that type of thing is get your documents cleaned up yeah. so that uh, errors are the exception. Got it, okay. But that has been suggested where we could run this on, say, the FreeBSD documentation tree once a week and email the results to our documentation list. Yeah. At present, I think that would be a terrible mistake and people would not, there would be so many problems reported that it just becomes noise and people give up. Right. Do you have a mode where you can run it on a dip? I have not tried that. I wouldn't count on it, but it's, it's something that could be tried. Warren, uh, for false positives, um, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to say about man pages, but um, in, in DocBook, it seems to me it should be possible to um, mark that up. That possibly uh, using the uh, phrase tag, um, which is which is a generic, it's effectively like span in HTML, um, and say a role phrase role equals correct, or something that would be reported by Igor, right? And you know it's correct to go and surround it with some markup. Saying basically saying Igor ignore this, and then you know so you could that could be basically done. mark those out so that you don't have to look at those false positives anymore. That's true. I would rather, if possible, I would rather fix the false positives to not be detected. Yeah, but I just wonder if there are places where it's just it's worth reporting this, and there is no way that we can think of computationally to uh, I can discern see between the false positives and the actual uh, mistakes. Actually, the the repetitive. The repeated words test, I think, mostly finds stuff in man pages. And I swear there's one that's uh, uh, LDAP. In fact, does that, anybody still need this to copy down the address? This might be uh, interesting to run here, but I believe I do have some actual live examples in here. And I don't know if any of these actually have that repeated words. But these are live, this is running it live off the, uh, off the man page directory on this machine. And you can see the type of thing it finds. Uh, but yes, I could see adding tags, except I feel like the more doc book markup you get, the worse it is. But I see what you're saying. You're adding something to tell Igor, this yes, this is correct. I know it doesn't look right. The the downside of the, the other downside of that is that you get people who don't want to change things where it's technically incorrect. Say so, yeah, I, I say it's correct. I, I can't imagine why you wouldn't want to add more markup to DocBook. <laughs> <laughs> more the merrier. More is always better. Uh, I wonder. I had several of these that I. <coughs> Almost like a little sick egg. These are live tests off the Porter's Handbook now, and I've added new tests now, so now it looks for contractions. What's this? Purple uh, spell. I wanted to color code all the errors so the same type of errors would be in the same color, but it turns out there aren't that many fancy color codes. And also, some of them are really hard to tell the difference between. That says a lot right there. There yes. aren't enough colors. Uh, <laughs> so what they are is they're sort of mixed so that you won't get one type of error that blends into the next because it's the same color used for different errors. Assuming you're not color coded. Yes. But it's, I would hope it's better than the, the bracket markup, which you can also use. And in fact, I think some people use it. I can't imagine it being easier to, to read. Oh, and uh, our bad phrase test. Uh, this is another oh, judgment cool. call. I hate that. If you must, MFC, MFC and FreeBSD is merged from current, meaning to copy code or features from the, the bleeding edge into the current release or the current stable. So MFC is a verb. But I, if you're going to do that, I think the apostrophe is a mistake. 
but that's a judgment call. Admittedly, <laughs> <laughs> how would you spell it otherwise? Uh, without, you would say what you merged I would, from current or MFC without the apostrophe, and that's the thing about this particular tool is it tells you it's mm -hmm. wrong. It doesn't this really place for accuracy. This way, it doesn't. It doesn't I guess that is what to do. that might be the next step though is to offer the guidance in the message because right. some that, people are going to need it. They're not the, going to be like, oh, I don't like MFC. The other test that dash Y is the one that does. I'm sure I've got it in here somewhere. Uh, is the one that does the style suggestion. Uh, that is a separate test that runs separately. I only have nine of these. There, that one. That one does offer suggestions for stuff that is more of a judgment call. Okay. Uh, That's uh, nice. The following, there are some that have been added to. The following, I hate that. Oh, can you I not, you know, can That's you not right. trust the reader to see that it's following? <laughs> because if it's not the following, then it's in the wrong place anyway. Okay. Following example, same thing. Do you feel like an, an autocorrect mode or an, some kind of thing where it offers to fix the problems? No, and that's a personal thing on my part is because when computers try to be smart for me, they almost always fail. I mean, a, the, a program, it can make suggestions, but I prefer to be the one making the decision. And I, I know where you're going, well, I understand even, that. Even a, an um, interactive mode. Even, a, even yeah, interactive, where it, it's you can press doable. a Y button if you want it, or add to skip it, or whatever. It could be done, but what I was really looking for was sort of a batch mode thing that could be run on these documents as that, in order to prevent the the second commit and the apology that you could run before the first commit. So you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm ready to commit this. Oh, I'll run Igor on. Oh, whoa. Uh, that will save me some embarrassment. And then make those changes that are that, okay. that are deemed right by you. And then commit. You have but yes. Files? What? Do you have make fun of this? Um, not for this. We could. Like make it part of make a check. Like we could. Uh, that's, it's been suggested. Uh, I think the problem right now is we have so many of these documents that I've been holding off correcting like white space where you'll get thousands of error reports because of our impending docbook XML conversion. And after that, I'm going to go for it. And there's going to be these huge, huge commit logs. And then we will get even more use out of this. And uh, when I mentioned advertising, I still, I watch the commit logs and I've made myself a test in there because people will commit something with an obvious indentation error and I'll say, hey, your indentation was wrong here. And by the way, here's a tool that will look, for, look at that for you and detect all that type of problems without you having to do anything. And you that's usually always, a pretty good selling point. do the advertising like in terms of guilt. Like, <laughs> Why well, didn't you write the story? Don't you know? <laughs> Usually, the idea of it making your job as a writer easier is a good pull. I mean, that, that's a big selling point. And the price of it, you know, for free, it helps too. <coughs> so, yeah, if you take anything away from this, think of that as an idea as opposed to an implementation. Have the stupid computer that's sitting there doing nothing most of the time help the writer, because that's what should be, instead of the other way around. I do have one more question, sorry. Um, you're running this against an SGML file. If that SGML file had any includes, I don't remember if it can do that, would it follow, would it be the problem? It doesn't, no. Okay. So uh, I wanted to but, tell you that I was running against it. Uh, on this particular one, we're running it on a chapter that's about our Linux emulator, which isn't an emulator. Okay. Uh, you could run it uh, with a, a pattern there, a wildcard for file names to run it against every okay. every file in that directory. Or you could use find. Uh, I do that all the time where you, you tell find to find every .sgml file and it runs it on all of those. Okay. In fact, I think that was in one of my examples, but it doesn't matter. It's just a difference in usage. When you run it on more than one file, it does tell you the file names. And if you give it a full path to the file, they will be shown. So you'll be able to tell what errors were in what in files. files. Okay. I, I'm going to run this against mine and see what it's, I should also add that there may be some FreeBSD specific stuff in there, okay. uh, but that could be changed. And it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. White space. A tab thing is like, 
white space I, alone would be a huge uh, problem. Another days. example of the FreeBSD thing is our documentation rules say sentences will begin with two spaces. And that, yeah. I was not aware of that. <laughs> uh, apparently that's a, there's, there was a horrible flame war about it. And what finally convinced me that it didn't matter and I didn't care which standard was which, is I looked back at email I received and I had gotten both in email and had never noticed the difference. Uh -huh. So if you can't see the difference, which I couldn't, then there is no difference. Yeah, so, I agree with you. So jumping back a second, you say don't use the following. What do you, how do you propose, okay, okay, in the following example, blah, blah, blah. What, how do you propose to structure a sentence? It, it depends on the particular one, but I see a lot of things that uh, do like the following example. And why not say do like this, or here's an example with a colon, that type of thing. Usually the following is another one of those things like obviously, where it's following. I don't need to be told it's following. I'm not going to say, do the, when it says do this with a colon, I'm not going to look in a different section of the book. It's another one of those things that really is not necessary. Uh, okay. I'm often. Yet I'm not saying often. Always. I'm just thinking often. like, in the way I use it, I would say, I would use it to disambiguate between, let's say you have several examples, and you might want to, you can't say in this example, because this example could well refer to the example that came just before it. If you want to talk about the example that, that is about to follow, uh, the next example. It, it really well, depends. Probably the next is the same thing. It, it, so. it really depends on context. Okay. But we have a lot of uh, a lot of tutorial type code that will say enter the commands as in the following example. And or also like if your computer is not working, try one of the following. We the table. Right. And it's in many cases it, it adds nothing except extra words. Not always. And that's the, one of the, the type of things that I'm concerned with as the reason that this is advisory as opposed to the other mode where it shows everything is errors because there's a judgment call involved there. And much as I would like to put down the rules to apply to everybody, I don't have that power yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.